The following episode can be viewed on the YouTube channel Bernie or Bust Television. Good morning, USA, and welcome to another episode of the Bernie or Bust Show. We're coming at Say It Isn't So Joe today from three different directions. The first direction is the leverage direction, the leverage angle. We're going to talk about how leverage will preclude Biden from winning the general election no matter what. The second angle, Joe has a corruption problem and it will flat out cause him to lose the general election to Donald Trump because Donald Trump will hammer him on it. So the first two angles are why Joe Biden absolutely can't win from a mathematical, statistical, political point of view. The third angle is a humanitarian one. We're going to try to make the case that if you were a Hillary supporter or if you are currently a Biden supporter or a Buttigieg supporter or a Warren supporter, we're trying to make the case that there is no defensible reason to vote for those candidates in the primary elections if you care about humanity. All right, here is point number one. New national poll utterly destroys the Biden electability myth. Newsweek came out with an article that describes this new Emerson poll, the first of the new year, and only 53% of Bernie Sanders voters will definitely support the 2020 Democratic nominee if he doesn't win. So this is a big deal from the leverage point of view. There isn't any way mathematically that Biden can win or Warren can win or Buttigieg can win because of how sticky Bernie Sanders voters are. If you look back at this memorandum from Victor Tiffany, you understand that last time there were a number of voters in swing states who voted directly for Donald Trump when Bernie was cheated out of the nomination. We are convinced and no polling analyst has yet to take issue with our conclusion that the Sanders-Trump swing voters will once again swing the election this year toward Trump if Senator Sanders is not the nominee. So that brings us to the new National Emerson College poll of 1,128 registered voters between January 21st and January 23rd, which found that 53% of Sanders supporters said yes when asked if they would support the Democratic nominee, no matter who. Another 31% of Sanders supporters said it depends on who the nominee is, and 16% flat out said no. So if you look back at the information from 2016, it was about a one and a half to one ratio of Bernie or Trump voters to Bernie or bust voters. So if those proportions are similar this time, what we have is a big chunk again, about the same size, who will say no to the democratic, oligarchic, sock puppet, centrist, neoconservative slash neoliberal candidate. Now the Newsweek article goes on to say that Bernie would probably not want his supporters to do this, but that isn't much of a hindrance to those of us who are Bernie or bust. We look at Bernie as a great candidate, but we don't like it when he sucks up to the DNC. We don't like it when he endorses Hillary. We don't like it when he apologizes to Joe Biden. We think he is dancing this dance with the DNC because he has to, but that doesn't hinder us. We don't have to do this dance, so we can use our leverage to help him. We think we're helping him, but more importantly, we think we're helping the world. We think we're helping the climate. We think we are helping people who are desperately in need of real hope and change, as opposed to the kind of hope and change that Obama did not deliver. By comparison to Sanders, 87% of former Vice President Joe Biden supporters said yes to voting for whoever wins the nomination, and 9% it depends on when the winning candidate. 5% said no to anyone who is not Biden. 5%. 90% of Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren supporters said they would vote for whoever is the nominee, while the remaining 10% said it depended on who won the nomination. So this is a powerful new argument built on top of the powerful old argument that there still are many, many supporters of Sanders who are far stickier than the supporters of the other Democratic candidates. Now going directly to the polling report, it says, among voters who supported Hillary Clinton in 2016, Biden holds a large lead with 49% support, followed by Sanders and Warren with 14% each and Bloomberg with 8%. 
Looking at voters who supported Sanders in 2016, 47% still support him, 13% support Yang, and 12% support Biden and Warren. Now here's a problem. When Democratic primary voters were asked who they expected to win the nomination, this is electability, this is asking them about electability, a majority predicted Joe Biden to be the party's final candidate, 53%. 24% expect Bernie Sanders to win the nomination, with no other candidate breaking into double digits. That's the electability problem we have. We don't expect Elizabeth or Pete to actually win the nomination, apparently. And we don't even expect Bernie to win the nomination. We just hope he will. Bernie is the top candidate in terms of policy. Even Biden supporters like Bernie better with regard to policy, if you look at the national averages. Everybody likes Bernie on the issues, but we still are believing this myth that Biden is more electable. What we need to look at is the fact that there are more than enough Bernie supporters who aren't gonna vote for Biden or Elizabeth or Pete. They're just not. And that means right now, Biden is doomed. There's no possibility he can win because at least in swing states, there are plenty of voters who will just simply vote for Trump. And then many more who simply won't vote for any corporate candidate no matter who. So let's sum it up. Sanders supporters, 16% will not vote for the nominee if Sanders doesn't win. 42% of Yang supporters say they will not vote for anyone else. That's amazing. So if you look at it in terms of leverage, a lot of these 16% Sanders recalcitrants will not vote for anyone who isn't Bernie Sanders, and a lot of them will vote for, directly for Trump. I'm guessing that of these 42% of Yang supporters, it's not a very big percentage who will vote directly for Trump. The demographics of Yang supporters are different. They tend to be younger. They tend to be not distributed as much in the swing states as the Bernie or Trump voters. So we have more widely distributed young people who say they won't vote for Bernie if Bernie is the nominee. I don't think that that will scuttle Bernie because they aren't all in swing states. If all 42% of Yang supporters were in swing states, they might be able to bump it away from Bernie and towards Trump, even if they're not going to vote directly for Trump. What they don't have also is the double bite at the apple. When Bernie or Trump voters vote directly for Trump, not only are they denying the blue candidate their votes, but they're voting directly for the opponent. So that doubles their leverage. I don't think Yang supporters are going to do that sort of thing. All right, so we've wrapped up the idea that Biden can win statistically. Now let's also look at his corruption problem. Yesterday, we talked about Zephyr Teachout and her article exposing Joe Biden's corruption problem and then Bernie apologizing to Biden for this same article. And that went down sideways with me, apparently also with Kyle Kalinske. So let's hear what he has to say. So Bernie has a surrogate by the name of Zephyr Teachout. She's amazing. She's awesome. She's run for uh, governor in New York before I voted for her. I was happy to vote for her. Um, she is an anti-corruption warrior. She literally wrote a book on corruption, and it's brilliant. Um, so she wrote an article in The Guardian uh, titled something like Joe Biden has a corruption problem. And she went into excruciating detail about exactly what that corruption problem is. You know, exactly how his entire family has gotten wealthy off of his political label, political connections. And this is something she's pointing out, by the way. This is real, and it's bad for what it is, but also it's unquestionably something that will be weaponized by the right if Joe Biden becomes the nominee, which means Joe Biden is not as electable as people think. Right. He has giant problems. Apart from not being coherent there's also the thing about like he will get pummeled on his record he'll get pummeled on outsourcing deals that he supported wars that he supported and detailed evidence of corruption so she writes this article all factual stuff then bernie apparently saw this got mad that one of his surrogates had written this article and then he instructed everybody in his campaign listen reel it in i don't want you calling him corrupt um, let's stick to just the issues. And um, this is getting too personal, and Joe Biden's a friend of mine, and I don't like that. 
Now, if he had just done that behind the scenes, I don't agree with him in doing that, but I could stomach it. I could stomach it. The thing I couldn't stomach was he then went out on TV and apologized to Joe Biden. He apologized to him because one of his surrogates called him corrupt. Okay, see, now I'm pissed because, Bernie, we need you to win this race. And what you're doing is I know you think you're being principled, but you're actually bullshitting everybody because Joe Biden is corrupt. And now you're helping him cover for his corruption by you, the most liked senator in the country, apologizing to him because one of your surrogates called him corrupt. That I can't stand for. That I can't stand for. That's actually embarrassing. Now, I get it. He's your personal friend, and you don't want things to get awkward when you see each other or whatever. Fine. But for you to cover up what the truth is, that's unacceptable. Because the reason why people like you, Bernie, is because you fight for the policies that improve people's lives, and you tell the truth. If you are refusing to state the obvious, which is that Joe Biden is corrupt, then you're not so much of a truth teller, now are you? Certainly on that issue, you're not. So that I'm not okay with. I think it was an embarrassing misstep. And guys, it's actually not a personal attack. It's an objective empirical description of reality. That's the thing. And so why is it okay to talk about Joe Biden's abysmal record, but not talk about one of the main reasons why his record is abysmal? It's not just that Joe Biden, you know, whoops, he happened to be wrong on a lot of the major questions that faced him as a politician in his career. No, it's that... He was paid to take the wrong position for many of those uh, issues. So the fact that you can't, you could talk about the problem, but not the root of the problem. No, 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 no. I can't stand for that. I can't stand for that. The other problem that he's going to go on to talk about is maybe there was a need for democratic unity in the impeachment trials, that they don't want the Republicans to be able to talk about Joe Biden's corruption especially if Bernie's camp has already just pointed out, hey, Joe Biden has a corruption problem, and that's exactly what's going to happen in the impeachment trial. So it's this uh, chess game uh, in the impeachment trial, and I, I think that Kyle's right on what he says about that. Um, now, the other argument some people have made is like, the reason why um, Bernie hit the brakes here is that we're about to have an impeachment trial, And in the impeachment trial, the entire Republican counter-argument is going to be, well, Joe Biden's corrupt. So Bernie was like, I don't want to give them any ammo in the impeachment trial, so let's, you know, pump the brakes and not say that. I don't know if that theory is true, but even if that theory is true, Bernie is still wrong. You're not allowed to bury the truth for, you know, partisan reasons. No, the truth, truth is always a defense. Truth overrides whatever your little, you know, goofy political calculations are. I don't care about your political calculations. And, by the way, it's a foregone conclusion he's going to get acquitted. It's a foregone conclusion. So why are we pretending like there's still an open question and, ooh, maybe we could find a way to get Trump? It's a giant waste of time. Again, you know, people might get mad at me for pointing these things out. I don't care. That's the reality of the situation. He's going to get acquitted. This is all a waste of time. Adam Schiff, and he can give grandstanding speeches from now until the end of time, is going to do dicky McGeezacks. It's going to do nothing. So I, I don't know if that's what Bernie was thinking. Whether it is or it isn't, he's still wrong. I pledge to use the word dicky McGeezacks at least once more in 2020 in a Bernie or Bust video. Now we're jumping to the compassion argument. We're going to make the case directly to centrist, neoliberal, comfortable Democrats who might vote for Biden, Warren, or Buttigieg in the primaries. I'm trying to make this argument based on something I just saw about a beagle who was rescued from a lab in China. This beagle had chemicals sprayed in its eyes and it went blind and it ended up losing one of its eyes. And the whole show is about how this beagle was rehabilitated and then rehomed. And the compassion shown here for this beagle is extraordinary and beautiful. Oh my God, thank God, I'm gonna cry, (laughs) they're here. 25 dogs are rescued from a laboratory in China. Thousands of these labs even exist right here in America. Beagle Freedom Project rescues animals used in testing. They've never been outdoors, never been on grass have never felt the kind touch of a human. There was some product that they were putting in Echo's eyes to test it, and she went blind. 
I heard Beagle Freedom Project needed fosters. I went to help and Echo fell asleep in my arms. I knew it was going to take a lot of time to help rehabilitate her. Gigi is my dog. She's feisty and very protective. Gigi started to lunge towards Echo and then stopped dead in her tracks and recognized that Echo was not your normal dog. I took her out to try and walk her. I think Echo was confused. I don't think she'd ever been walked before. As soon as Echo's paw hit the grass, she would steer the opposite direction. I wrapped a towel around her, and when a dog falls asleep on you, you know that you're doing something right. Is that a tail that's wagging? It's a wagging tail. The first time I saw her tail wag was about two days in, and then every time she heard my voice, the tail would wag. Hey, Echo! <laughs> the vet removed her eye because she was in so much pain for so long, and it actually ended up helping her. Echo started to come out of her shell in such a unique way, and she is the goofiest dog in the whole world. Echo. No! We've never heard that before. I'm going to make an analogy here between that factory that was spraying things in Echo's eyes and neoliberalism. I'm going to say that the neoliberal system is a factory, and that factory is obviously not set up for the dog's benefit. Obviously, that factory is set up to make money, just like our setup is to make money. And so the people who work in the factory, who sprayed chemicals in this dog's eyes as part of their job, they're like people who work for the neoliberal factory. They're the movers and the shakers. They're not the top. They're not the owners, but they work on the owner's behalf to make money for the owners and they get treated better than the beagles and they get treated better than other people in society because they have a factory job. Now, if you are part of society and you're not one of the beagles, then you may not see the need to change the way the factory is run. But if you are one of the beagles and then you think, well, maybe we could vote for a different factory owner. Maybe we could even vote not to have factory owners if you're an anarchist beagle. But whatever you think, you may want things to change if you're one of those beagles. You might want to walk on grass. You might want to bark. You might want to enjoy life. You might think life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness applies to beagles instead of just the people who own the system. So you can see where I'm coming from now. If you could vote for Biden or Warren or Buttigieg, you're voting for new factory owners who aren't going to change anything for the Beagles. Now, whether you're a Beagle or whether you're somebody who works for the factory, either way, you suck if you keep the factory ownership the way it is now. You suck. So what I'm trying to say is, this is the third argument for why Biden's electability should be a myth, even if it isn't, but it is. So this is why you should vote for Bernie Sanders or anyone who is an actual progressive who is going to change the way the beagles in life are treated. We need not only for the beagles to stand up together and change things, but we need the factory workers to help too. And you are the comfortable Democrats who could vote for a neoliberal sock puppet. We need you to change your minds now, before the primaries. We've got a lot of pain in this world, not just in the United States, and we have an existential crisis in the form of climate change. We need to change the way our economics work. We have a lot of challenges that we're facing, and we can't do it just with the beagles. The people who are higher up in the order need to also decide that beagles are worth helping and we need to all work together. And you know, I'm not talking about beagles. I'm talking about black and brown people, not just in our country, but in other countries where they get the shit bombed out of them just because they live in a place that the United States feels is an important economic interest. This is a big deal. And this argument is the most important of the three, but it has the least amount of leverage. The first argument and the second argument preclude Biden becoming president. 
So if you know that and you still vote for them, Biden, Warren, or Buttigieg in the primaries, you know you're voting for Donald Trump. You know it. And despite your protestations, there's no way you can deny it. If you understand those first two arguments and then you still don't vote for Bernie, you are voting for Donald Trump. We're not going to hear the bullshit that we heard last time that the Bernie or Busters gave us Donald Trump. That's not defensible. Now, the Bernie or Trumpers gave us Donald Trump, but they're still there and they're not going to listen to reason. So if you don't like it, you're going to have to vote for Bernie if you don't want Donald Trump. You've been warned. You know what's going on. And it's up to you to do the right thing. Now, let's pretend you're at this Bernie rally and this young man is directing you through a series of exercises to help you be more compassionate. Just a few months ago in Queens, our candidate asked us to ask ourselves if we were willing to fight for somebody that we didn't know. And in the months since that, millions of people around the country have answered with a resounding yes. So today I'm going to ask you to be open to getting to know the human being to your left and your right. The human being that you've been fighting for, the human being that has been fighting for you, the human beings who form the most powerful movement in the history of electoral politics. So if you'll indulge me, I want you to kindly ask your neighbor, can I hold your hand? <laughs> so if you have permission, if you have permission and you're holding the hand, I want you all to close your eyes and just follow my instructions. If you grew up in a happy home, please squeeze your hand. If you grew up in a home that wasn't so happy, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever wondered where your next meal might come from, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever been harassed or catcalled as you walk down the street, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever been told to stop crying, that tears are cracks in your armor and signs of weakness, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever fallen ill and self-medicated or ignored it because the bill might hurt more than the ill, please squeeze your hand. If you've lost a job, please squeeze your hand. If you've laid awake at night wondering if your son or your daughter was going to come home safely, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever been assaulted, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever sat in a Planned Parenthood or a free clinic waiting alone, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever been pulled over by a police officer and prayed to God that you'd make it home, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever gone to war, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever gone to war with your mind, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever had to dodge a bill collector's incessant calls, please squeeze your hand. If you ever smoked a joint or a blunt while listening to your favorite artist, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever been misgendered or judged for your identity, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever had to wake up at the crack of dawn to catch a bus or ride to visit a loved one behind bars, please squeeze your hand. If you've ever had to argue with a family member about a prehistoric idea, please squeeze a hand. If you've ever wondered if a loved one may be deported, please squeeze your hand. If you believe in the power of love and action, please squeeze a hand. If you believe in the power of human beings to change history and rewrite their tomorrows, please squeeze a hand. If you believe that there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come, that the long arc of the universe always bends towards justice, please squeeze a hand. I hope. If you are ready to work every day as a creator of your life, to do everything in your power to build a political revolution that will shake the very foundation of this empire, please squeeze a hand. Now raise them. And though Nina Turner couldn't be here, our national co-chair couldn't be here, I want you to repeat after me with these hands. We will rebuild our communities. With these hands. We will free our people from prison. With these hands, we'll fight for a nation that makes our grandparents and our grandchildren proud. With these hands.
we will build power and transformation. With these hands, we will do miracles. Now repeat after me, power, transformation, and miracles. We want it. We need it. We got to have it right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Tell your neighbor, thank you. And it's not beagles. If you're like me, it's worse that it's beagles. But let's at least care about our fellow people as much as we care about beagles. Let's rescue everybody. In the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we can afford to do this. So don't let anyone say, how are you going to pay for that? We can pay for it. We just have to care. And I'm saying again, if you care, you can't vote for anyone but Bernie in the primaries. And if you're really gangster about it, you're going to say, no, I'm not voting for anyone but Bernie in the general election either. Even if he's not in it. Even if you just stay home. But if you vote for a corporate candidate, then the puppies are still being harmed. Get on board the Bernie or Buzz train. Get on board the Bernie Buzz train. Once you hear that clickety clack, there ain't no time for turning back. Get on board the Bernie Buzz train. The preceding episode can be viewed on the YouTube channel Bernie or Bust Television.